Uh, welcome to welcome to the call. Um, a little housekeeping before we get before we uh, get started. I'm just going to um, say thank you to our national education leaders. They are Ardex Americas, Custom Building Products, Go Resilient Canada, Laddercree, Mapay, Merchant One Payments, Primco, Tager Building Products, Tarket, Tramex, Uzin, and Wilson M. Beck. Thank you for your continued support so that we can keep these messages heading out into the, into the industry. Um, this is what we're looking at today, a new best practice um, that outlines, explains, um, takes a deep dive into the world of taking a, a, a straight edge test to determine acceptable flatness for a floor covering installer to proceed with his work. I know as a flooring contractor years ago, I used to show up on site with my straight edge and, and find lump, uh, bumps and dips and all sorts and would always stress about now going to the general contractor to say, yeah, according to my straight edge, you owe me an extra. Uh, the conversations rarely went well because his first thing was, well, prove it. Uh, where do you get that from? Where's it written? And it never was. And so it was always a fight. Um, any contractors on the call uh, with us today will, will know it's, it's a daily, weekly occurrence, brutal. So we at NFCA decided to um, gather some experts uh, from across the spectrum, um, put a committee together and, um, and have a specification writer, Keith Robinson, um, very smart dude and uh, very good at writing these things out so that we can all make sense of them, um, to put that committee together to, to form this document, which is now being offered to industry for free. Um, we said we wouldn't publish it if we didn't get unanimous agreement around the table that yes, this made sense. So um, I'm gonna welcome two of the committee members uh, to uh, our call today who are gonna um, essentially form a panel and we're gonna discuss this document, take it apart. It's like 15 pages long. Um, so we're gonna break it into bite-sized pieces. Um, but before we get going, I'm just gonna introduce them. Seth Pavanik uh, works with Ardex Americas in the technical service department, has done since 1991. Seth has led the Ardex Academy training program. His areas of expertise are concrete, moisture and concrete, um, proper substrate preparation, underlayments, toppings, and decorative applications. Seth is active in many industry associations and standard organizations, notably ASTM, FCICA, Starnet, Install, IICRC, uh, NAFCT, I don't know what that one is, or MSA. That will be a, uh, another session, Seth. You're going to have to explain all these acronyms to us. Um, Seth also serves um, as the IICRC chair for the ISSI certification. I mean, these IICRC, huge organization, well respected out there. ASTM, say no more. So, uh, Seth, your credentials um, uh, are your reason for being here. I mean, you were hand selected for this. So, uh, Graham. Technical sales rep, Intersource Trading Company. Uh, Graham's worked um, many times with us at NFCA to bring his wisdom and balance and, and perspective to the table. Um, really appreciate that, Graham. You're a great resource uh, in the flooring industry since 91. Graham began his career with residential and commercial flooring installation. He achieved his master certification for commercial linoleum sheet flooring, as well as NWFA installation and sand and finish certification. As a manufacturer's rep and certified trainer for polished concrete, he worked with Install. For those of you who don't know who Install is, uh, that's the union floor layers um, uh, uh, training curriculum, uh, very smart outfit. Um, uh, they have a great curriculum. Um, so it's it's uh, it's quite something that you've assisted with, with their, um, their curriculum, Graham, and their polished concrete uh, section of that that organization so welcome guys let's um we've got a lot of content here so let's crack on um other committee members were don Baletic, president of bd floors clayton shull independent floor covering inspector graham's with us keith robinson research and development specification writer with dialogue and then of course seth have already introduced so graham over to you what is the problem there's no problem in floor flatness no what are we doing here? That's fantastic. <laughs> we can make this a very short seminar then. But maybe if we look at that first picture there, Chris, 
Um, I think we can see it illustrates nicely what the problem is. Here's a floor and it's pretty evident. Uh, there's a big ridge in the middle of that fl floor. The finished floor has been put down. I think everybody on this call, whether you're a flooring installer, a specifier, end user, what have you, you're probably not going to be happy if this is your project. So what's the problem? Well, the, the industry has always called for or used a 10 foot straight edge. There's an amount of deviation under a 10 foot straight edge uh, or that reference line, then it's not acceptable. But the problem was that 10 foot straight edge test method was never really uh, clearly defined or understood. So how did this floor get installed that let's say we all don't accept it as up to standard? Well, you can imagine in the if you put that straight edge down close to the window where the reflection is, you could put 10 foot straight edge there and not see much of any deviation. You could put it, uh, put that same straight edge close to the person taking the picture in this image and see no deviation. So in one sense, uh, this could be a floor that's deemed as acceptable. But if we, do we have that next picture of it when we put the straight edge or is that gone? No, that's gone. Okay, so the difference is if we'd put that straight edge teeter tottering across that crown right in the middle of that floor, we would see there's a significant problem. I think when we looked closely at it, that was about half an inch over three feet, uh, which is substantial. So the problem is the way this test was done or interpreted, uh, well, there was just too much room for interpretation. So a person with an agenda to get this floor installed and move on quickly. Um, could essentially skew the results moving forward, uh, saying that all these tests were passed, it met tolerance, and now um, it's not their problem, but the end user, uh, not many people will be happy with the end result. So this was the problem that needed to be addressed by the committee. And there is thousands of dollars at stake when you're having those interactions with the builder. Interestingly, we just a couple of weeks ago got a call from a contractor, commercial contractor, um, could we get an inspector on site at a multifamily uh, development around 200,000 square feet, um, LVT scheduled? Um, builder is saying, we're not paying for any leveling work. The floor is flat enough. And what you're doing with your 10 foot straight edge is incorrect. So now what? And that's when we got the call. Could you send an inspector out to explain how this test should be executed? And it's just, it's funny because two weeks prior to the phone call, we had just released this document. So it became very topical. Like, um, so we, uh, we went, I, I went with the inspector actually to that, to that site and we talked it through with the builder and were able to explain. And, um, you know, at one point the builder's giving his version of how the straight edge should be, should be used. And I remember saying to him, well, you're just, by doing that, you're trying to cheat the test. It doesn't make sense. And that was when the sort of light bulb went on and we all started to get on the same page. So 200,000 square feet, you can imagine, you know, even if it's just a couple of dollars a square foot for leveling work, and it wasn't like it was a disaster on site, but, you know, you're half a million dollars in a, in a blink of an eye. So this is a big uh, ticket item. Delays as well um, will get you into deep water with your general contractor. So we have to, we, we recognize we had to solve this. We've got to get into this. And so... Uh, Graham, well explained. That's that's the problem, for sure. Seth, I'm going to bring you in and and ask the question: Why can't we all just get along? I know that's a that's a question that uh, I'm sure uh, many people on different job sites ask quite frequently. Um, you know, there's there's many many people involved in projects, as we all know. Um, certainly, in our part of uh, the construction process, you know, you got concrete, you got flooring, and it seems like we we butt heads a, a little more than we should. Uh, many parties there, so something that contributes to that is a little bit of disparity that we will talk about. Um, you look at, we're gonna look at concrete and the specifications in concrete and look at flooring and the specifications of flooring. There is a little bit of disparity there that contributes to us uh, not getting along so well. And we'll kind of go through that here in a future slide. Who are these two trades do you think, uh, Seth? We say again, Chris. Sorry. Who are these two guys representing? Do you think? <laughs> yeah, probably uh, the the concrete contractor and a flooring contractor, <laughs> or maybe it's the GC and the flooring contractor. Maybe it's the GC and the architect. Who knows? It, it could be any, any of those. 
But there's okay. yeah, there's many 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 um, parties in, in involved in just our segment of construction. And why don't we go to that next slide? We'll kind of take a look at them. You know, certainly you got the architect and the and the owner. You got a structural engineer that is involved. You got the concrete contractor that's pouring the concrete. You certainly got uh, the flooring contractor doing the installation. Uh, you got the um, ready ready uh, ready mix company, the concrete manufacturer, uh, as well as the constructor, uh, who also can be termed the general contractor. You know, we say at the top of the slide there, it takes a village, and I'm sure you you've heard this uh, in the in reference to maybe raising your kids, it takes a village to raise raise a kid, and you know it uh, in some cases takes a village to make sure that um, you know the concrete and the installation of the the flooring, um, you know we get we get a, a result that everybody's happy with. Um, the problem here is is the, something that contributes to the problem is is everybody has different wants and needs. You know, if you take a look at the owner and the architect, uh, you know, they may, they may want, want the concrete for, for an aesthetic, you know, reason. You know, you look at the structural engineer and, you know, he wants something that has the, 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 the strength properties that this building, you know, does not come tumbling down. Um, you know, you get the concrete contractor that is contracted to place it, then he certainly wants something that's workable that he can place uh, to make flat. Um, ultimately, the floor covering, uh, you know, contractor and the flooring manufacturer need something that is flat so that their, you know, their flooring can uh, perform as intended. You know, when you look at the the concrete manufacturer, the the the, the, the ready mix company, you know, they should be supplying a material, this concrete material that's uh, able to meet everybody's needs, and, and certainly the constructor or the or the general contractor. You know, they should uh, be overseeing everything to ensure that the, the finished product meets the needs so that uh, when, when it's all said and done, we have a floor covering installation that's that's uh, that the owner is, is happy and uh, happy with and it'll perform as intended. So um, go ahead, go ahead to the next slide, Chris. Um, we just wanted to fill in that gap, right? Yeah, sorry about that. So. When you're looking, we're gonna we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the placement of concrete. Um, you know, we'll look at uh, the, the formwork, the placement, uh, the finishing of the concrete, and we'll also touch base on a, on a term that you know not everybody might be familiar with, uh, but it's it's hardened concrete finishing. You have wet wet concrete finishing is is the placement, and we'll talk about a term called hardened concrete finishing. You know, what do we need to what do we need to do to that concrete? You know, once it is cured and Flooring's ready to be installed. You know, there's items that have to be taken care of. When we on a previous committee um, where we were looking at how to properly spec the placement and finishing of concrete, so that so that essentially Division Three concrete and Division Nine flooring dovetail, um, it was a great committee, and we had the uh, one of the one of the concrete uh, associations, the National Concrete Association's uh, executive directors, was was present at that during the. Um, the year or so that we met and it was during our, our meetings that we discovered this hardened concrete finishing tray the missing component which has led to so much uh, uh unhappiness on site lawsuits good company going straight to to court to set uh, to settle their differences because this was not being specified by the spec writers so once like uh, Seth's going to point out here, you can wet finish your concrete, but then it's going to change shape. Who's going to come and fix it? The floor guy. No, not the floor guy. And so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. But that's the importance of hardened concrete finishing cannot be overstated. Yep, excellent point. So when we look at the original pour, you know, certainly there's a, there's a lot of design that goes into this. Um, you have formwork, you have uh, reinforcement, uh, you know, the rebar that you're seeing there. Um, certainly the, the, the ready mix company has to um, you know, provide a mix that, that meets the, the, the structural engineer and architect specifications for the material. But, you know, ultimately, you know, it, it gets mixed in the truck. Uh, it comes down the chute. It gets um, poured uh, in, in place. You have to consolidate it, as you see down in the lower left picture. Um, you know, there's screening that takes place um, uh, to, to get it into place. There's floating that takes place to flatten it. 
um, you know, during the placement. And ult ultimately, there's a wet finishing process that happens the, the same day that the, the concrete is placed. And, you know, here's an example of, um, you know, ride on finishing machine here, uh, the, you know, whirly bird or helicopter, if you will, with, you know, it's a, it's a dual, dual finishing process here. But this is done, obviously, to make the concrete very smooth so you can install, you know, finished flooring on it. What sort of flatness is he, is he shooting for there, Seth? <laughs> that's, it all, all depends on the specification, and it, that, that's a tough thing to answer. Uh, we will kind of dive into it on the specifications for, for concrete, um, you know, what's specified for the concrete, and then ultimately what the specification is for the finished flooring and why there, why there is some disparity there. If, is it true that if, if you told this guy you're shooting for three sixteenths over 10 feet, he'd say you're nuts? No, yeah, that's, <laughs> it, it, it's very possible. And for him to, to ride across the floor here to try to achieve that um, is easier, easier said than done. I um, think they're, they're typically looking for a half inch over 10 feet. But I mean, this Canadian Standards Association, I think they'll call for three eighths or a half inch over 10 feet. And this is why, I mean, you're going to get into it, but hard concrete finishing has to come in on the back of this process to get to that 316 over 10 feet. Yep. So um, with, with the placement of concrete, there's many things that can go wrong. You know, we, we've seen overwatering concrete. We've seen uh, rained on concrete, frozen concrete, overworked concrete. You know, if they use that trial machine and one area uh, too too much compared to another area, they can create swales and bird bass, if you will, in the concrete. Um, but provided that everything goes according to plan, you know, Mother Nature doesn't come into play. There's still a couple things that I want everybody to be aware of that is inherent to concrete, uh, the concrete that we're used to uh, working on and installing flooring on day in day out. Um, and the first of the two is, is concrete curling, okay? When concrete is poured on ground and there's a moisture sensitive floor covering to be installed, you know, there's a specification that a vapor retarder should be used uh, on the ground uh, over the sub base, you know, prior to the installation of that concrete so that we don't have ground, you know, water coming up, coming up into the concrete. Um, by following that specification, um, it creates a situation where you can have differential drying, meaning the mixed water and the concrete will dry out of the top via evaporation, and it can't go down because you have a, a vapor retarder, a piece of plastic, if you will, underneath that concrete. So that differential drying um, can cause curl, as you see in the picture here. This is a concrete slab that's on ground, on a vapor retarder. There's a saw cut that's been placed, and that differential drying over, uh, you know, over several months of uh, the concrete drying creates a curl that that happens at the joint, and um, you know the concrete shrinks, it curls, it cracks right at the base of the joint, as you see there. And this is something that's been going on for years. I can tell you the very first project that I was ever on uh, as an Ardex employee. Back in 1991 was a target store, you know, concrete slab on grade and the flooring contractor brought his straight edge out and put it over top of that joint. And he had a nice teeter totter going on because we had slab curl. And that was the first time I ever saw, you know, a straight edge being used uh, to evaluate a concrete slab and simply putting it over that joint, it, uh, it teeter totters and you know that it's not flat, very visual. Um, we see this all the time. Um, the other um, uh, occurrence with concrete, if you want to go to the next slide, Chris, is deflection. <laughs> and I'm sure you guys have seen this on the second, third, fourth, uh, and above story applications. This specific drawing that I, that I put in the presentation is um, concrete slab on metal decking. You've got concrete columns uh, left and right. You've got concrete beams. Um, and then you have a metal pan, a corrugated metal deck, if you will, that's on the beams. The beams typically have a slight camber, so they're raised in the middle, if you will, so that when, by design, so that when the, con the weight of the concrete is put on the corrugated metal decking and that weight is transferred to, the, transferred to those beams, 
you'll get the flexion with the hope that the concrete, the flex and the concrete ends up being flat. But we know that that just doesn't happen. They try their darndest to try to build that into the design so that when the concrete, the flex, you have a flat floor, just doesn't happen. Um, this is concrete on metal deck. Uh, if it's cast in place concrete with forming, forming and shoring, or even uh, cast in place conk with post tension cables in it, it's it's all planned and there's an intent. But you know, all too often, you know, we find deflection, and that's just too, you know, between slab curl with with concrete on ground and uh, deflection with concrete, uh, you know, above ground. These are just two things that we see in construction. Um, you know, all the time and have for years. We were, we were at 120. Sorry, we were, we're at 120. We were just on a project where there was a two inch camber built into the slab. So you got that natural hump. And we were talking about how, how do you sleep at night? If you're, you're hoping to come back in a, uh, after the concrete has cured and, and reached design strength, and maybe there's still a, an inch of camber. Now, what are you going to do? <laughs> it's right. such a roll of the dice. It's, um, Incredible to me that this is the way to plan it up, but it just doesn't, it never works as planned. Yeah. Next slide. Yep. Next slide. <clears throat> so, um, even when things go perfect from an installation of concrete, you know, there's still things that happen, like we just said, deflection, um, slab curl, uh, and there's certainly other issues uh, that can come into play, but it, it leads us to hardened concrete finishing where mechanically preparing that concrete or mechanically finishing that concrete so that, um, you know, we create a flatness that would be, you know, suitable for the installation of finished floor covering. And certainly grinding with a planetary grinder with diamond blades and a, and a, a dustless HEPAVAC system, as you see in the picture, is, is a mechanical method of hardened concrete finishing to, to get that surface within tolerance uh, suitable for floor covering. If you don't have this process specified and budgeted and scheduled, you're not going to have flat concrete. The straight edge is going to be your worst nightmare when it shows up on site. So this has to be a part of the process. <laughs> the another other side. Method, yeah, no worries. Another method of uh, hardened concrete finishing would be a placement of a, of a leveling pro uh, product. Uh, Self-leveling, as you see in the picture, Pouring enough material to create a, a flat surface, you know, suitable suitable for floor covering, and um, you know certainly uh, there, there's trial grade products that go down thicker as well that could be screeded off the high points and into the low points uh, to create the nece necessary flatness um, in the concrete. Um, you know, can concrete contractors do something like this? They certainly can. Um, flooring contractors do this as well, but. You know, that has to be understood out of the gate. Um, it has to be understood, you know, months into the project prior to uh, getting late game when, when the flooring is going to be installed. Um, you know, this certainly comes with a cost. Uh, the flooring contractor does not, you know, bid, you know, leveling and, and uh, screening a product. They may do touch-up work uh, with every contract, skim coating, just making the surface smooth, minor imperfections, things like that, but certainly not leveling or, or screening of products into place to, to flatten things out. Right, important point. Skin coats do not level or flatten. <clears throat> and actually this work, uh, hardened concrete finish of the, the pouring of self-leveling compound and grinding is division three. It is concrete work. It's just that the general contractor just has to choose, do I want ABC company to do it or XYZ? Floor cover, concrete guide, doesn't really matter, but it is in the specific architectural specifications, it belongs in division three. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, concrete is 3,300, division three, self-leveling, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, is, is 3,650, uh, meaning, you know, division three. Absolutely right. Uh, here's uh, certainly a picture of uh, the skim code application, scratch code, if you will, depending on what you call it. Uh, certainly, the flooring um, floor covering installer, the flooring contractor, may um, bid this type of a thin application, unsanded material, to to do touch up smoothing. But again, as Chris said, this is not you know correcting flatness issues. This is only taking a surface and um, uh, and, and making it smooth enough to put flooring on, not not creating flatness. Um, 
out of a floor that is not meeting flatness specifications? I would say that the trade scope of work for the floor covering installer starts with an electrical impedance moisture test, just to check that the surface is dry, and then a scratch coat, light hand sand, and then trowel out your adhesive and get on with your job. That's, that's where things begin for us. Kind of like painter. Uh, do you expect the painter to go to site and fix the tape, the mud on the drywall? Absolutely not. Well, both flooring and paint are referred to as applied finishes. Floor guy goes to site a, a and works on a provided um, acceptable substrate. Um, very important to, to understand that. Absolutely. So I mentioned a little earlier uh, the disparity that we the disparity that we have, um, you know, within our portion of construction, the, the flooring section and uh, CSI uh, Concrete Specification Institute has a series of divisions um, for construction, any construction project, starting off with general requirements, site conditions, going all the way to mechanical and electrical. And the two that Chris has already mentioned right now is Division Three, which is the specifications for concrete, and Division Nine, which is the specifications uh, that floor coverings uh, fall into. I mean, there's other finishes that fall in there too, but but floor covering falls into that, that category uh, as well. So uh, we do have a little bit of disparity between the two, and we'll get into that. Um, with okay. the next slide. So from a specification standpoint in division three, which is concrete, um, the specifications call for the concrete floor flatness um, uh, be measured uh, and, and specified in F numbers. Um, maybe you've heard that before, maybe you haven't. Um, this is a picture of a D meter uh, that, that takes measurements and I'll, I'll walk you through that in a, in a, um, in a future slide here. Um, which this specification is dramatically different with uh, in compared to the, the floor covering materials in division nine. Um, the trade practices um, for the installation of finished flooring, um, you know, measure the flatness uh, with a straight edge, as you see in the bottom picture there. So uh, we're going to kind of, you know, look at these two things and compare the two and show you the disparity. But the bottom line here with this type of disparity between the specifications in division three, in our, in our trade um, practices in Division 9, um, you know, the concrete contractor can meet the specified tolerances, but then by, by the time the, the flooring contractor gets there, um, you know, to install the floor covering, use the straight edge, you know, it, it may reject the, uh, the flatness of the slab. You know, a couple of things that play, play into that, too, uh, in addition to not having the uh, comparable uh, specifications here, as we talked about, um, a slab curl and, and deflection, you know, all that, all that happens after the concrete's installed. It's interesting. You've got that picture at the bottom of the straight edge. It looks like it's been shimmed. Well, um, that, it does, but that's, that's a, a measuring tool to see what that gap is. Right. So it's interesting. When I, when I was on site with uh, that 200,000 square foot multifamily development, the, it's interesting listening to the builder describe what they expected us to do with a 10 foot straight edge really just mirrored or echoed what the uh, concrete contractor would do with that straight edge. And it's kind of like, like you're going here into FF and FL numbers. That is a concrete measurement system and it, uh, that is transferred somehow into the world of flooring when it doesn't actually line up and you're going to point that out. But so when you're on site fighting for your life, trying to say, look, this sub floor is not ready for me and I'm not just trying to cheat the system here and, and look for an unfair extra. Um, what you're fighting against is a hangover from the concrete trades practice. Not their fault. It's just that this is the first time someone's seen a 10 foot straight edge on site. It's probably a screed. And so the way they use it is suddenly all of a sudden it's, well, this is how the floor guy should use it. And there you have a, a serious disconnect. So sorry, Seth, can't continue. Ah, no worries. All good. All good. So let's take a look at, um, uh, at ASTM 1155, this is the, the, the specification for the F number system. Um, what you see in the picture there is called a D meter. And this is a tool that has a pod in front and a pod in, in the rear. And you rotate this um, just doing like a 180 degree turn. You know, you grab the handle and you rotate from front to back. And you basically walk this across the floor. And this machine is taking a reading 
um, every 12 inches because the pods, the, the pod in the front and the pod in the back are, are 12 inches apart. So um, with F numbers, it measures floor flatness and it also measures floor levelness. And what we're talking about in this slide here is floor flatness. It's taking a measurement, a 12 inch measurement, and then you're rotating that or walking it forward another 12 inches. It's taking another measurement and it is looking at the change in, in slope in, in that two foot span there. And it re records that, and it and it it'll you you do this uh, across the uh, across the concrete. I'm not going to get into how you run the test, um, but they there there's in the specification it tells you how to conduct this uh, across the across the concrete to um, run the test, and then it spits out a number for flatness. And basically, the higher the value, the the flatter the concrete is. And this is all executed. Uh, according to an ASTM E1155. So if you if you download ASTM E1155, it'll tell you exactly how to execute this test, right? Correct. That's the next slide for you. Yep, absolutely. So the, the first one that we just talked about was floor flatness. This one is floor levelness. It's it, you're still getting readings here, you know, every 12 inches as you walk this across the floor, but the machine, the D meter, is actually now looking at the change over a 10 foot span, okay, to see what the change in levelness is over that span. And again, you know, it's a higher number is, is meaning the concrete is more level, you know, lower number, it's not quite as level. Uh, sir, yeah, um, now, dur uh, in the specification here, um, after they pour the concrete, you know, this D meter would be used to validate that the concrete meets the specification for the project within the first 72 hours. Okay. You know, not, you know, a month from now, two months from now, it's done right after placement, three days after placement at a maximum. Okay. The other thing that this, um, one of the things that this uh, D meter and this test does not take into account is what's happening right around joints. Uh, right around uh, 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 from a wall, they you, you stay within two feet of uh, of any slab boundary, whether it's a joint, you know, whether it's a wall, whether it's a, a block out, whether it's some sort of penetration. You're not running this machine um, across a joint. Um, you know, you're keeping two foot shy of everything. Okay, compared to if I would take a straight edge and go out to a control joint. And drop that straight edge over that control joint, and I'm seeing rocking. You know, I, I can see that that is out of out of flatness from a tolerance standpoint. And that's one of the reasons this test method does not correlate into the world of flooring. And yet, builders all the time say, "Well, yeah, we've met our FFFL. You're good to go, Mr. Floor Guy." Wrong. Yep, you're ab absolutely right. And we'll and we'll make that comparison. Hang on one 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 minute there, Chris. Sorry. A couple other things, real quick. You know, we talked about curling, uh, we talked about deflection, you know, things that happen after the concrete has been placed. And, and certainly, you know, this, you know, this machine does not take that into account because you're doing the test at, you know, 72 hours after placement. Okay. Historically, there, there's been no way to assure that the floor would remain flat or level, um, you know, as it was when it was first measured. You know, we have seen deflection, we have seen curling, you know, for years and years and years. Okay, um, add to this the difference uh, in measurement techniques uh, between uh, measuring concrete with this uh, with the D meter and, and the straight edge. And, you know, you can easily see, you know, how that, um, you know, when the flooring co contract arrives on site, um, you know, there's a risk of, you know, rejecting the flat the slab from a flatness standpoint. Okay, no, the builder doesn't see it coming. You know, if no. you pour the concrete in January and let's say you finish pouring on the 15th of January, by the 18th of January, you've measured the concrete using this device and confirmed you've met spec. Now, as a concrete uh, trade, you can invoice and leave the site. Nine months later, when the flooring is scheduled to be installed, no one has even discussed how we might measure uh, for all the deflection and the curling that's gone on. We just expect, well, the floor guy can arrive on site and keep going. Rejection of slab is a brutal consideration three weeks from deadline when the floor guy shows up. So um, carry on, Seth. Yep, absolutely. Next slide. Next slide. 
so there, there's been attempts to try to correlate, you know, FF numbers to gaps underneath a straight edge. You know, for you guys to do moisture testing, it's kind of like, you know, they, they make try to make a comparison of RH testing in concrete to calcium chloride te testing. And, and, and it's not, it's not an equal, um, you know, you can't just, you know, do one and translate that into another. Um, you can make a comparison at best. And then the same goes here with FF numbers and the gap underneath the straight edge. You'll see here on the right that they, um, as I said earlier, the, the, the higher the number, the flatter it is. So they try to make a comparison of an FF50 being equivalent to an eighth and 10, an FF32, three sixteenths and 10, and so on. But, you know, we've already talked about different things that happen. Uh, slab curl, for an example here, uh, that, that D meter stays away from, you know, two feet away from the joint. And if we have slab curl there, you know, that may not be taken into account uh, when they're, you know, running their D meter on it. You take your straight edge out, put it across that, that uh, control joint, and certainly if it rocks, you know, you visually see what's going on, you know, at the joint, if you have any curl or not. So the builder no has not budgeted for that difference. Right. And there's no money to pay the floor guy. So just do it for free. Yeah. And that's not what the, the floor guy, you know, has in his contract. Like I said earlier, he has minor touch up, minor skim coat, scratch coat, and that's the extent of it. Any leveling or screening of patching materials, that that's that's not in the contract. And uh, the, the bottom line here with this disparity, you know, we, we got to communicate better. We, we got to communicate with the, <clears throat> the GC uh, and, and educate uh, and, and, and kind of get out in front of this before, uh, you know, late in the project, um, you know, where it ends up being an extra. And, you know, it all starts with pay for that. It all starts with the spec. You know, if the spec is, is not filling in the gap properly, um, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, it's not going to be a pleasant co conversation. So if the spec is right, it can guide this process. <clears throat> and so, you know, uh, I'll show you a resource uh, uh, at the end of this presentation where you can go get a proper, uh, accurate concrete specification. There's lots of information for free. Um, we encourage you to use it. If you're a spec writer, architect, or you're involved in writing up these documents, um, great resource. Seth, thank you. That's uh, that is into the world of the FFFL and concrete placement. It's uh, not well understood. Certainly, why would we in flooring understand it? But we're held responsible for it all the time. Yeah. Graham, on to you. Right. So here's the stuff that we do. That, uh, those of us in the flooring industry have to deal with all the time. Flatness tolerances. What are they? We can look at the next slide there. And it gives us some kind of general requirements. This is what the NFCA has published. Um, for most floor coverings, resilient laminate hardwood, you're looking at about 3 sixteenths of an inch over 10 feet. Uh, beyond that, anything worse than that, if you want to call it quarter inch, about the only thing you can put over that is some broad loom carpet. Now, big asterisks on this section though, that is a general guideline in lieu of nothing else published, but you always have to defer to the manufacturer's guidelines, manufacturer's tolerances. So if they give you something different than this, they know their products, it's been tested, it's been engineered, you have to follow the manufacturer's tolerances. They'll always supersede these general requirements. Let's move on to the next, uh, next slide there. Why do we need to get this so flat? A uh, number of reasons, but first and foremost is safety, trip hazards. Uh, if we think back to the that first slide, the big crown in the middle of a, of a walkway, it's a trip hazard. So if somebody trips and falls, it's a nightmare scenario. It's the worst case scenario. So we have to avoid that first and foremost. Let's look at like care facilities, you know, um, walkers and people on crutches and, you know, with a shuffling gait, it's, it's so easy to trip and fall. Yeah. As we get older, we tend to um, have less of a spring in our step. And usually the consequences of an older person falling are much more severe. So this is something we cannot ignore. Let's look at that next one. Uh, rolling loads. Once again, when it comes to oftentimes in healthcare, they're rolling gurneys, sometimes very expensive medical equipment, or people just trying to get around uh, with mobility devices. If you don't have flat surfaces, it can be very problematic and oftentimes dangerous, or like you see in that um, 
with that trolley there, you imagine that loaded full of uh, food and cutlery and hey, you know, you could even tip and fall over causing injury or expense. Here's a big one. When people specify a flooring product, they typically tend to calculate the life cycle cost. But now if you've got improper substrate preparation, you can imagine where that maintenance equipment is going to be cleaning the floor. If you had that big crown like we saw in that original slide, well, that proud area is going to take the brunt of it. It'll cause premature wear. So that whole area will now have to be replaced for that one area that was out of tolerance because it's just going to wear out faster. It's going to catch everybody's foot. It's going to catch all of the maintenance equipment and it will lead to a premature failure of that entire flooring system. Let's have a look We're, at that. Sorry about that. We're at 140 now. All right, I'll talk like an auctioneer. Here's a big one, um, not so much for dollar value up front, but just look at it. Somebody has gone into this office and bought and paid for a nice new floor. But I think most of us on here would agree that floor does not look right. It doesn't look good. Um, and that's not because it's a bad floor or even necessarily a bad install, but it does not look right because the proper floor flatness was not achieved before they went ahead and installed it. Chris, you, uh, I think this is your photo, isn't it? What was, what was going on? Uh, five or six years ago now, uh, an office, just a, a 2,500 square foot office, the floor was ripped out and replaced because it looked like this. Um, uh, and it was one of those cases where the GC had a deadline, said, get it done. Uh, oh, you, he owed the subtrade money. And the, and the subtrade said, okay, I need, I need you to pay me because i got to pay my guys. If I lose my guys, I lose my business. And it, that's, that's the pressure point here. So he got on with the job. And I don't know who ended up paying for the refit, but uh, it was a nasty mess. Yeah, just terrible all the way around. All the all that flooring ended up in the bin. Everybody, nobody comes out of that looking good. Nobody comes out of it happy. Uh, let's look at the next one. Here's another one. Um, as we have new products coming out, the industry seems to be going more and more rigid for some good engineering reasons. Um, but with those rigid floors, there's you don't get what we used to get, what we call drape, essentially. A rigid floor is not going to follow those contours. Now, in this case, this is a, a relatively thin SPC floor, and it's a floating floor. So you can look at that cross section there of the joint. Um, if that floor is not supported properly underneath, you can imagine that joint being over a, a non-flat area. A lot of pressure as a person walks on it, forcing it to conform to that non-flat area. We see all the time those joints break. Um, there's a great image of it. You get that little eighth inch or quarter inch ski jump across the, that joint. Uh, and that's not really repairable unless you tear that out, tear that plank out and replace it. But you've got to fix the subfloor underneath. So lots of good imagine, material is going into the bin. You imagine that, that subfloor. Sorry, Greg. <clears throat> One millimeter of thickness. On a on a stone polymer composite, so it's brittle to start with. How is that going to function over time? If you don't, uh, you know, and these manufacturers will call for one eighth over six or three sixteenths over ten. It just doesn't make sense to me. I, is it viable as a flooring system? I just we, we we inspect so many floors that look broken like this, and and it always gets lumped on the on the installer. Sometimes it is because they have to be managed very carefully and deliberately when you're putting them together and, and taking them apart even. Don't use a hammer, that sort of thing. But uh, boy, even if you put it in right and you put it over a 16th in 10 feet, is it going to survive? And, and Chris, you and I have been out to floors together to look at it. And there's just because of a lack of understanding of what the subfloor needs, where it needs to be. Um, we see these things all the time installed over skateboard parks, not flat substrates. Can I add to this, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Rick. Oh, hey, hey, guys. So I've gone through this and actually went back to the manufacturer. Um, these SPCs, the problem seems to be that they're blending the five to one limestone instead of the traditional two to one. So initially when they were made, they had much more of a plastic polymer in it, which allowed them to drape, as you would say, uh, Graham and flow with everything. But of course, then they were impacted by direct sunlight, like a composite deck, they would expand. So I got into this huge with a supplier because we had an issue. 
and uh, they didn't understand at the beginning of the argument that I completely understand how they got here. So they found that the limestone would actually stabilize it from expansion and contraction. And then they found that the limestone actually increased their margin because it was cheaper than the polymers. And then they stretched it from two to, um, two to three, and then to three to two, and now they're at five, uh, from five to one, I'm sorry, to three to one, and there's just too much limestone. So in one of our suppliers, they spec this for over suspended subfloors, so residential housing. And the standard deflection of a family walking through and with a, a, a 16 inch joist on a subfloor is enough deflection to snap all those joints. We ended up in a conference call they denied it and while they were uh, fighting their case i held up a piece of their floor in zoom and as they're trying to tell me that it's not too brittle i just went down at one snap at a time and broke off 30 inches in 30 seconds while they were talking and we ended up a settlement they reimbursed us so they came back and said well rick the resolution is if there's any deflection in the subfloor you should have added another half inch ply uh, to that. Now you're talking about a $2.30 cost material. You can imagine a customer wanting to spend yeah. another $3. That doesn't fly because the half inch, the yeah. half inch yeah. underlayment isn't going to deal with the structural yeah. deflection. Yeah. So it's the change in their one, they changed the blend so that they could stop the uh, expansion and contraction due to heat and all of that from 10 years ago. And they found limestone stabilized that, and then they got carried away and found that more limestone ended up with more margin. And it's usually gray in color. If it's like uh, Torley's has the black and gray, uh, their flex and the blacker it seems to be, we're having better luck. And so I, we do a fair bit of residential with this when we have deflection. So if you can find something that has less well, limestone, you have less. Kind of you're kind of dictated to as to what product you use because it's specified. The architect yeah, yeah. making this to us. So. Yeah, you are. So uh, in my group, I've got six of us other than me selling here. I actually overrode and told everybody they couldn't sell that product in, in, right. in, in any suspended subfloor situation. So this is this is really interrupt, but I thought it would add into that because I just had a massive battle six months ago. I on appreciate that's topical. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This is the importance of connecting to the specifiers and the architects to help them understand. Yeah some of the shortcomings of some products out there. Not all products are like that. Well, um, and manufacturers shouldn't shouldn't approve them for certain substrates if they're if they're not going to cut what house meets, you know. Uh, where is the what, ASTM that tests these products? Yeah. You know, that's a whole other conversation. I heard the, the other day that there's a the caster test is applied right. to this type of product, but the caster test is 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 executed over a rigid surface. Right. Not right. uh, not an SPC on an underlay, right. so it doesn't even test. It doesn't yeah. really test the product. So yeah. there should be an ASTM that specifically targets uh, floating floors yeah. over underlayment and locking mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. So until that gets resolved, I think everybody just needs to be aware. We had a couple cases, and we were. Right. Thank okay. Thanks, Rick. Great input. Yeah, well, great. Yeah, uh, you can have. Uh, in addition to that, so here's here's the other side of that coin. So let's take a product that does drape. Yeah, let's go on to that next one, Chris. Okay. Um, a product that does drape, the old VCT. Now, if you're going to install that over a non-flat floor, you've got a modular product, and I don't care if it's VCT or, or a glued down vinyl plank, modular product installed over a non-flat floor, because we're dealing in three dimensions now, you'll get tile runoff. You'll start to get things where it looks like they're not square or they're not lining up properly. So kind of regardless of the product that you're using, if you don't flatten these substrates, you're going to have installation problems or performance problems or aesthetic problems. Uh, another great one, it, whether it's flash coving or you're just installing a baseboard, uh, a solid or a rigid baseboard, if you're trying to flash cove along a substrate along the wall that is wavy, that's, that's um, non-flat, just an absolute nightmare. You've got that dead straight edge, you, you're snapping a chalk line or, or a laser line for the cap of that. And now you're trying to get that product to conform to a non-flat subfloor, ends up looking like a really messy install. It's a, it's a very, very difficult install. And everybody's 
especially those pre-formed Cove products. I mean, what a frustration for the installer. I just, oh, I can feel it now. You're giving me flashbacks. Yeah. Sorry, anything else to add, Graham? Uh, no, you, I think we, we should uh, move on. We've got limited time left, so you're up. Yeah. All right, well, I'll take over here and uh, just quickly get in and out of how to use the straight edge. There's a whole chapter in this document dedicated to just how to execute this test so there's no misunderstanding on site. I've heard, we've had plenty of pushback. Why are you talking about a straight edge? Uh, it's, it's Stone Age technology, you know, we're at 2023, but this tool is simple and as basic as it, as it is, absolutely has a place on site. What else are you gonna use? Um, in a situation like this, after the floor's installed or even before, um, just to show you what, uh, this is a photograph I took on a, in a residential setting. What I do is uh, slide the straight edge back and forth. Uh, I look for the problems um, because uh, the idea is if you're before you've installed, you look for the problems so that ultimately your floor covering does not become a very expensive sample. You're looking for the problems. You're doing everybody a favor by doing that. Um, uh, uh, inadequate subfloor prep is no excuse. So that it's just you, you, you just got to do it right. So here we've identified a fulcrum point or a high spot with that brattle. There's a there's a an arrow there to point. This is where the thing teeter totters from. And at this end, the um, carpenter's square is measuring the deviation, the gap space between the surface of the floor and the underside of that straight edge. And so I'll give you a close up of what it looks like when you look along that arrow line. And there it is. We've got three quarters of an inch. And we call that three quarters of an inch gap over six feet. And the manufacturer is looking for one eighth of an inch. So we are expecting nothing but problems with that floor. And, and, and this is just one example of many in this particular setting. Uh, you know, I know where to look for um, those those uh, slope off points, it's, it's all the foundation points, wherever foundation stops, um, but floor plate continues, you'll have some kind of uh, deflection or um, not deflection, but uh, a slope off or a parachuting off um, of the floor system. So those are your, your problem points. This is a video, guys, just gonna show you how to look for problems with a 10 foot straight edge. You do this right across the whole floor plate and you mark out the high spots or the low spots with chalk and then someone is going to come in afterwards and grind or, or, or um, pour cementitious underlayment. This is not rocket science. It's just never been explained before. So anybody can do this. Other acceptable measure methods, very simply, um, well, actually not simple. This is complicated. This is hey, out of my Chris, uh, or, sorry, hey, hey, Chris, can I just add one thing about yeah. that to really highlight uh, what was going on there? The test that was being done wasn't, um, he wasn't doing it to find ways to make it pass the test. He was looking everywhere on that floor to find out if there was going to be a problem that would that would result in the floor covering failure or performance or those things. So that really was at the core of this panel committee um, to get that point across. We're not testing to say we've tested, we're testing to avoid future problems. Exactly, well said. That's, that's what I ran into with the builder on that multifamily project. He was testing just so that mm, it would be accepted and no more extra leveling would have to be done. But, you know, in that case, it was an eight millimeter lamina, which would have failed. And then it would have been a lot worse for him. So point cloud survey. Yes, this is above my pay grade. This is the sort of thing engineers love to, to play around with. But this is the type of technology that will collect thousands of data points, uh, because honestly, you don't want to be in this space with a 10 foot straight edge. Um, you'll end up at the chiropractor's probably. But uh, mm -hmm. this type of technology is going to serve you very well. And we've seen on numerous large projects where we've, uh, we've been involved, um, uh, this technology creates maps, topographic maps, heat maps um, that really help you to quantify and budget and price for the, uh, for the necessary work to get things flat. Um, so this, uh, for example, all the red, red spots here are low, indicating low areas and the blue 
high and, and green and, and orange sort of thing, yellow in, are in between. And when we correlate this or sort of expand this out to measurements, here's a close up of that same um, floor plate, but now you've got physical measurements. So you better believe we can be very, very accurate, right? Seth, this is your, um, this yep. is your baby, right? Absolutely. So what you do every day, I'm sure quantifying self-leveling compound. Yep. Other types of lasers, we've all seen stuff like this. There's uh, uh, many, many different devices on, on the market that do a great job. And uh, back to the Stone Age, string line. Um, Graham, Graham, one of your favorite tools. I remember you uh, brought this up at the committee meeting and it just totally made sense. There, there's, there's reasons to use a low-tech solution in some, in some cases. It, was, it can be very accurate. String lines and plumb bobs were used to build the pyramids. Um, the, the reason this is sometimes a very helpful tool is estimators um, or sales reps, they, they're not likely to be carrying around a 10-foot straight edge. That's just not practical in most cases. But you can put a $5 string line in your pocket, pull it across a substrate to, if nothing else, uh, besides your own understanding what's going on on the floor, to read the floor, it highlights very well to GCs or, or end users, right. homeowners. You can see right away, once you have that straight reference point and you see that the subfloor is not conforming to it at all, um, it's, it's a tool to aid in this discussion, if nothing else. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, a dull, non-reflective concrete or wood subfloor is not going to show you deviation when the light falls on it necessarily. But as soon as you put that reflective, shiny, resilient floor down, it's the complete opposite. Words matter. Graham, you were going to tackle this. Yeah, this is, in one sense, this is where our committee started. Um, the reason we had to come up with some accepted definitions is we had a, a panel or a group of people from different facets of the industry, and we all know these words and we all use them pretty comfortably, but we didn't all have the same definition or understanding of these words. I think Keith won't mind me telling, telling the story. Um, he was, he's a brilliantly talented spec writer, uh, but when he saw the word smooth, in his mind, he understood it to mean absence of waves across the subfloor uh, versus somebody who's installing, say, a commercial vinyl. This would more refer to texture. You've got a highly reflective finished floor that it feels like if you drop an eyelash or, or a grain of sand, it'll telegraph through. Um, so we needed to take a moment to get these definitions um, and somewhat agreed upon because both were acceptable definitions. We need to standardize it. So we can look at, we won't go through all of these, but this is an important point to mention because at the end of this new document, we've got a glossary that I think is going to be a very, very helpful tool on site just to make sure everybody involved in these decisions um, they're all speaking the same language. So we have a, a definition of flatness. We, and we see it illustrated there nicely of that is not a flat substrate. But where problems can arise with the understanding of this word is flatness and levelness sometimes were becoming interchangeable. And in common, common speak, people talk about leveling a floor. Uh, for the most part, floor coverings that we're talking about in this circumstance don't need level, they need flat. So you can imagine, for example, a ramp is flat, but it's nowhere near level, but you can absolutely install a floor covering on that ramp. So we needed to understand what we're talking about when we say a flat substrate. Now, if you move to the next one, oh, and, and there we have it. Great example of somebody had taken the time to pour a half inch hydraulic cement underlayment that 10 foot straight edge, you couldn't slip a business card in any gap underneath that straight edge. They were able to achieve flatness, but not necessarily level, but that's all that was required for the manufacturer standards for that floor covering. Now, if we move on to the next one, level, we probably have a little bit of an understanding of that. We see the image of that level there, that bubble is in between the two lines. It's parallel to the horizon. It's the, calm, the lake on a calm day. That is level. And there are some circumstances where level is absolutely required. But for most of what we in the floor covering industry need, we don't need level, but we do typically need flat. Uh, versus the next, the next definition there, uh, smooth. 
So you can have smooth, but not flat and level. You think of a skateboard park, the texture of that skateboard park is smooth, but it's waves all around. It's nowhere near flat or level. So when we have these definitions, these terms clear in mind, and we're all using, working from the same set of definitions, once again, it's a tool to be used on site to reduce misunderstanding, miscommunication. Um, and just as, as an aside, we've got, do we have those CSP images? Yeah. So a lot of times we're typically for us in the flooring industry, we're dealing with CSP two and three. That's kind of our sweet spot for where we need to be. Um, CSP two. What does CSP or, stand for, Graham, just for those? Sorry. Yeah, of course. Concrete surface profile. How smooth or how rough that is. And this is from the Concrete Institute. And you've got some images there that it's they've tried to standardize standardize these different textures um generally speaking if you're going to put down a, a highly reflective say resilient floor um you're sort of in the world of csp2 it's smooth enough that nothing should telegraph through for the most part um but if you're going to put hydraulic cement underlayment self-leveler uh that might be too smooth for some manufacturers it's not it's too smooth for it to properly bond so Typically, they'll be calling for a CSP3. So having all these items, these, these terms defined clearly, when we all read those same instructions, using that glossary at the back of the document will help us understand and accomplish these installations uh, smoothly and successfully. We are at 2 o'clock. OK. Thanks, Graham. I'm going to wrap things up here. So free access, yes, we want to really underline uh, uh, the fact that this document is is easy to download. I'm going to take you there right now. Um, there's the homepage of, of National Floor Covering Association, nfca.ca. Um, if I get you to roll your mouse when you're looking for this document over education, then you'll see these drop down menus pop out. And you go down to free resources, into the next roll down menu and click on this and you will go to the document. Scroll down till you see the word here in blue. We are providing this to industry at no cost. You can download the document here for free. When I click on that, there is page one of 15 pages of basically what we've just been talking about for the last hour. So a quick recap of what we've done, where we've been for the last hour. The problem has been explained. Um, thank you, Graham. Flatness tolerances, um, reasons for the disputes. Seth, thank you. Um, acceptable and unacceptable measurement methods, trade definitions, all in black and white, and where to download the document for free. How can we help each other for uh, those architects on the call, um, those manufacturers, reps, um, builders, contractors, everybody who's got um, an interest in this topic, uh, we can definitely help each other. A, we've got the specifications to help spec writers um, um, get the right language into the documents. Nothing worse than getting, uh, you know, I don't know how the spec writers do their job. I mean, to, to write something that maybe you haven't done yet, you are expected to write how this is gonna roll out. Must be incredibly stressful. Um, to get that nasty phone call on Monday morning, well, you know, from the general contractor, this spec doesn't make sense. So why don't you come here to site and show us how it's done? That is not a pleasant call to have to take. So we're helping by giving you the right language so that those phone calls don't happen. Manufacturers, we would encourage you to reference this document um, and help sort of remove the confusion and disputes on site so that um, your good customers, the contractors, the, the sub trades, the flooring contractors aren't having these arguments. Um, they can just refer to your manufacturer's guidelines. Constructors and trades, no different. If you all understand this stuff, we'll all talk the same language on site. And societies, institutes, associations, standards bodies can also reference the document. That document being NFCA 821, best practice for measuring substrate flatness for covering installations. And that concludes our presentation. Uh, we're welcoming questions. Please. We're going to get off scot free. <laughs> I, I don't know, Chris. This is Greg here. Um, hey, Greg. 
as as far as the um, the standard practice for for measuring um, with the straight edge there, is there any sort of um, language in there? Typically, you take your straight edge, you you put it down, you take a look for these um, these irregularities up to three sixteenths underneath your ten foot straight edge. Is there any allowance in there as to where the touch points are of the floor and where the gap is? Um, you know, I, I, I will say that if you have a 3 16 inch di um, dip in a floor on two touch points that are six feet apart and two touch points that are three feet apart, it still sounds like the, the, it's within specification but I can tell you that's two different situations. Yeah, you're not you're not looking for two touch points. Yeah. No, that's but I'm just that's what I'm saying. Is there any allowance there for the span of which that three sixteenths occurs? Because you know, three sixteenths inch dip between a six foot area and a three foot area are two different situations. Yeah, no, no. All you're doing is sliding that. Uh, it's exactly what we're talking about. It, and okay. one, one thing I might add to that as well is that 10 foot straight edge, um, you think of that as your unit of measurement rather than just a tool to slide around. So okay. it, it's over that that unit of measurement, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you go back to that green floor with the half inch deviation and you you start with your 10 foot straight edge on on one side of that half inch ridge, and you have a flat reading, no gap. And then you slowly push it, push it, push it. And as soon as it gets over the half inch, now you've got a one eighth gap. And you keep pushing, now it's 316, keep pushing, now it's half inch. And you just keep pushing until eventually it just, it just tips. And, and the point at just before it tips is probably three quarters of an inch. That is your reading. It is the worst case scenario that you go for. Because and just because it's a three quarters of an inch gap doesn't really change the amount of work you're going to have to do to get that ridge out. You're just going to grind that ridge, and very quickly that three quarters of an inch will disappear into quarter of an inch or or become acceptable. But but my point is you're 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 sliding that straight edge um, uh, to find the worst case scenario. Yes, a, a ten foot um, a ten foot uh, 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 length. But you don't stop and start because you've got 10 feet. It's, it's overlapping all the time. It's a continuous uh, test. And also, um, no maximum number of placements or measurements. Does that make sense? I'd like to clarify on this question that he's talking about. And I think that you hit it for the most part, Chris, on your sliding of your straight edge. I think it's important for everybody to understand that when you're sliding your straight edge, you're likely at the mid point of your straight edge when it teeters. You're not with a two foot overhang that you're pushing down on because that's gonna give you an eight foot overhang on the opposite direction, which is going to increase your gap. So I think his point was your straight edge needs to be more centered to where the hump in the floor might be. And, and to that, yeah, and there's a question put into the chat as well. Once again, we're talking about a unit of measurement for reference, not necessarily the tool that you need to assess the floor. So in reality, that hump in the middle of your floor, hypothetically speaking, that needs to be, come down, call it half an inch or three quarters of an inch, whatever it needs to come down. So yeah, you could take your 10 foot straight edge and have four inches of that 10 foot straight edge on one side of the hump and the other nine foot eight on the other. And if you teeter it there, well, I'm two feet out. You know, yeah. the, end, the, uh, the far end of that straight edge is two feet in the air. That's not what we're talking about. That unit of measurement is still uh, an amount of tolerance within a 10 foot span, but that's really not the only way to assess what's going on on the floor. You need a reading of the floor, the elevations of it. And then you need to understand which high spots need to be brought down, which low spots need to be brought up to make it flat to within tolerance that is used that unit of measurement, that 10 foot unit of measurement um, to, for those allowances. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, it does to me. I just wanted to make sure it was clarified that you're not measuring 
you you can you can cheat if you want to as the inspectors is what I was trying to get to without actually having to say it by yes. doing just that I can slide my straight edge more so to the one side of the hump and push down and I can say look how bad you're out of out of right. flatness let's just uh, let's speak to that point uh, there is language in the document that says it must be a freestanding uh, straight edge unleveled freestanding so you cannot yeah. push down on and in all honesty, that's uh, that was a real challenge of this committee of how do you write a document that will um, keep its um, keep the integrity of this testing process if somebody is performing the test not in good faith. So if you're trying to cheat it one way or the other, showing that oh yeah everything's fine, go ahead and install, or look at how terrible this floor is, you need an extra hundred thousand dollars to flatten it. It's very, very challenging to get that wording right if people are performing these tests in bad faith. Uh, if you read the document, I think it's covered fairly well, but at the end of the day, if somebody wants to cheat, there's all, it's really hard to engineer around that, but I think we've come pretty close with it to use this as a guideline. Freestanding uh, straight edge is the best way to, I think, explain it to everyone. If you're using the freestanding straight edge, then you don't have to worry about the pushing down. You're you're then finding that midpoint where it teeters, and that's the best way to explain it. Yeah, and that's covered in the language in this document. Awesome. There we go. Any other questions? Not a question, Chris, but a comment. Like no we're reaching out to fix this at slab level. That's the whole idea here. Idealistically, we'd like to fix it at the point of slab, the, the, the initial slab or before a build out, correct? Because fixing it after, like one of the installations you showed with the straight edge going through the doorway, that condo or that space, fixing it after is just a nightmare because now you've got baseboards, door jams, everything. Uh, for instance, we had a dental clinic, they were remodeling, it was never done right initially, they, the designer wrote into respect that we were to fix all that, what she failed to understand is that all the offices had glass walls with glass swinging doors, and the floor was up three quarters of an inch and the doors only had a quarter inch underneath them and the, not, the, not doing it initially meant we were unable to do it then because the doors would have to been removed, recut all the, it, it's just impossible. So that condo you showed to fix that after once a customer understands the amount of self level that maybe on the, the, the west side of that wall opposite that door and now you have three quarters of an inch of concrete and maybe a ceramic tile that now your floor is actually higher than your ceramic because it was covered <laughs> well, right. Doing it the second time around in a remodel, it's almost it's almost a non-starter for any job, to be honest with you. You're you're band-aiding it. It's very difficult, yeah. It's, and it's always a combination, nine times out of ten, a combination of grinding and pouring. Yeah. So something yeah. like around that door jam, it would be a, a lot of grinding. But I've, yeah, in some cases, you've got a structural slab and they're not allowing you to take a sixteenth off. Right. Um, you know, pouring cemetery is I mean, it's heavy stuff. Sometimes they don't want the, ad the added weight. Now what are you going to do? Um, yeah. This is where construction has to come together, recognize things are not perfect. And what compromises are we going to make and agree to on site so we can keep moving forward? <clears throat> I, will, I will add to this though, Chris, um, generally speaking, and there are specifics that will change it, but generally speaking, the earlier in the building process this is addressed, the cheaper it is. Yeah. Um, you can wait till the very end when the installers are about to start putting floors down and then stop everything and try and address it then. And that can still work, but it's the slow and expensive way. Um, so I think the earlier we get in front of these conversations, even uh, ideally in the specification process, uh, the least amount of money, the least delays there are. And, that, and that's a fact. And the second time around that they're remodeling and they want to correct this because it bothered them the first time, but they, they ended up accepting it. Now you're telling them what the true cost of fixing it is. And 80% of the time the response is, well, I didn't realize it'd be that much. And if we lived with it before, I guess we'll live with it again. And, and so you never get the opportunity to truly make it right for them because of yeah. the cost of fixing it the second time around. Yeah. Well, we've been 
<clears throat> we've been screaming this for the from the hilltops for the last yeah. three four years and you know i gotta say there is <clears throat> movement in the right direction positive news you know we get calls from significant sized builders um before they've broken ground when they're planning their slabs uh you know for three four five six months time they're talking to us about what surfaces do you need to get what moisture right. content right uh, and they've actually budgeted for it because you know yeah. the, uh, we told the, the the world of specifications put this language in division one, where the general contractor will go directly to general one to us to accumulate their big costs, and they see oh we got to we got to supply this slab at three sixteenths over ten feet, budget another two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and now there's money to, to pay for it. Like Graham says, it's, it's a hell of a lot less expensive if you do it that way around than the other. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You got to catch it in the beginning, and Graham's right. Like uh, after after the fact is the most expensive time to fix it yeah yeah great chat guys thank you good <clears throat> well you know what anybody who reads this document if you see something that you want to add to it needs questioning we are absolutely open book here just call us you know the committee was is passionate about the topic um saw the value of getting this this written um doesn't mean to say it hasn't stopped uh you know getting tweaked and 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 improved on if if that's what is needed then uh, we're all ears about that so stay in touch with us let us know and with that graham we'll let you get back to your beach and